Professor Edgar has graciously agreed to entertain any questions that uh, the members of the audience might have this evening. I would ask this. Mr. Bridges has some microphones since we're, of course, uh, recording this for rebroadcast across the PD. Would you uh, wait uh, to, for one of the microphones to come to you before you phrase the question? Any questions? No questions. At, ah, right. Dr. DeMarco. Dr. Edgar, I've been an admirer of yours for uh, many years. And it's the first time I've seen you in person. Um, do you feel like that South Carolina, over the, the subsequent four decades, has remained ahead in terms of our race relations? Uh, I think you're going to, frankly, you're going to have to depend upon the communities. Uh, things are very different in South Carolina than they are elsewhere. People will tell you that. We have a net immigration of African Americans in, into the state, which has been going on since the 1980s. It's something that has surprised folks. And one of the interesting things about that return or the immigration of persons of color to South Carolina, in some cases, it is individuals themselves who left the state in the 50s because they had no economic or social opportunities or political opportunities here. In some cases, their children or grandchildren but they're coming home to South Carolina. And this is brought home to me very vividly. Uh, one, one of these, this is a long time ago, I was teaching summer school, teaching South Carolina history. And I was running a little bit late for class. It was an 8 o'clock class. I was running a little bit late. And somebody was teaching my class. I had been, I had been teaching uh, Willie Lee Rose's rehearsal for Reconstruction about Buford and Port Royal. And sitting in the front of the classroom with this elderly black woman. And she was saying that that's exactly the way it was in the 1930s. This woman was a native Columbian. When she was growing up, she was not allowed to walk across the campus of the University of South Carolina. And she was taking that class because she had moved back after a career spent in New York City as a public librarian because she wanted to come home. But just as a matter of personal she was going to take a class at USC and she was going to take a South Carolina history class. But what she was describing was the conditions at Penn Center and Beaufort Port Royal, because that's where she had had to do her, her uh, practice teaching. There were only several places that, that, te that students who went to then SC State, which is where she'd gone, could do their public school teaching and that was practice teaching, and that was at, uh, at Beaufort Port Royal. And I must say that for the young men and women in that class, that was a more vivid lesson than I could, than I could ever teach. Are there problems in South Carolina? This state's so, this is, we're inhabited by human beings, and we've got some nice people, we've got some not so nice people. I mean, let's just be honest about it. But in terms of people sitting down together, I, I like to watch groups, and for example, I look at it, this audience, and instead of seeing all persons of color over in one place and all black people sitting over the next, I look around, it's people sitting where they want to. Watch playgrounds. Sometimes you'll see young children together, black and white. Sometimes you see black children here, some white children. The difference in South Carolina now is people can make that choice. They have that choice, that opportunity. And nobody's going to say anything why they chose that particular opportunity. But, you know, uh, unfortunate things have happened. And by the way, it's unfortunately um, bigotry knows no color line. It works both ways. And incidents do happen. But when they do happen, I think of things that have happened in uh, later times um, and the reaction by public officials in South Carolina. I'm thinking about um, I guess both of these happened during Gilbert Campbell's time, the restaurant over in Aiken, Aiken. Um, which would not admit black patrons had its license revoked. Uh, liquor license. Liquor, liquor, liquor license, which if you can't sell drinks, that's where you make your money. Uh, also, there was a case in North South Carolina um, where a, an integrated softball team was not allowed to, to play and the governor invited them to the governor's mansion. That's right. So I mean the, 
the, diff, the response of people in public life is, is that's all important. Again, I use the old thing of fish rots from the head down. If it's rotten at the top, it's going to be rotten all the way down. Uh, and we've been blessed in this state, for the most part, with wonderfully moderate leadership. Governor Hodges, I'm trying to remember something specifically that maybe nothing like this happened, you know, during your term, but I can't, I can't remember. Um, no, we had no controversy. We only had the Confederate. <laughs> graduate, the first class from this university, and my question is this, based on this, December 18th, 1865, the 13th Amendment was ratified, followed the next year by the 14th Amendment, which is the Equal Rights Amendment, and then the 15th, and then we had Reconstruction in the period that's known as Jim Crow, which was a very ugly time, but at what point, when was is the seminal time, event, or person when we can sort of say that things really made the change. It probably was not Robert McNair specifically, but a little thumbnail right when we can sort of graph it and see when the change occurred. Well, I think you can look at the 1960s. In fact, if Governor McNair would be here, and those of us who've interviewed him, he would say, well, Walter, I didn't do that all by myself. We did this together, but it takes leadership. One of the things that was, was interesting about South Carolina compared to the rest of the South in the 1960s is that in most Southern states, the political figures, the political leadership, were part of the problem, not the solution. In South Carolina, they were part. It, the business leaders took, took a role here. They didn't take that in other states necessarily. The business leaders, the civic leaders, the religious leaders, the political leaders work together. But you've got to have somebody at the top who is making this happen to make say, say, look, this is what we're going to do. Um, and like I say, Bob would never be the last person to say, I did it, because he was a very humble man. But folks, had we had somebody else in the governor's chair, I don't know where we would have been. Remember, we, we, we look with pride. Clemson was desegregated with no problem. But we were the last southern state to desegregate an education institution of education. So it took a long, you know, 1963s, I mean, even Alabama has done it by, by um, the time Harvey Gantt goes to Clemson. So it's the 19, it's, it's, the, it's a crucial decade, I would say, from 63, because that is a year of decision in South Carolina. That's when communities across this state, for the most, most of the communities said, look, we're dropping the indignities of Jim Crow. In the major cities, they said, we're going to have uh, programs to help train workers, to help hire workers who have not been allowed to work in certain places before. We're going to form biracial committees. We're going to listen. That's important. We're going to listen. We're going to talk. Something that hadn't happened prior to that time. But you take 1963 to 1970, look where we were at the start of that decade in 1960. And by 1970, there are African Americans being elected to the General Assembly in South Carolina, which had not happened since 1895. And they're being elected from counties that are majority white. You know, it's interesting, if, if I might just add to that, I think if you polled most of the political scientists in the state that focus upon state, uh, state politics, you would find almost without exception, every one of us would say the change, most enduring change to which you refer began with Bob McNair and extended probably into the John West administration. That, uh, that period of time was, was truly the seminal period for changing the nature of the state. 